They could not solve the case. They could not seem to find the clues. This looked like a mystery that just couldn't be figured out. But that's why they called me. Detective Sherlock Maison. After hours of top-notch detective work, Sherlock Masson scoured the campus trying to find the missing piece that would put this puzzle together. The clues were a little more challenging to come by until he realized that no one was off limits. No stone could be left unturned, even if that meant interrogating the staff. I have some questions for you. Mm-mm. No, you don't. Okay. No, I don't. Psst. Hey, up here. Up here. Where were you yesterday? I was here. No, you weren't. No. Hey. 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 Seriously, could you get that ladder for me? I can't get down. Where were you yesterday? Hey. Blake, what are you doing here, bro? I'm driving. What are you I'll doing? I'll ask the questions. As the day came to an end, Sherlock enjoyed a hearty and nutritious meal. Only to return to his quarters, just to realize his unfortunate defeat. But then, it seemed that hope slid his way. And the answer to the mystery was... If you've never played it, go home, play it tonight. It's a lot of fun. And it's all about, there's, there's been a crime, and your job is to be the detective and figure out, there's three parts to Clue. There's a who, there's a what, and there's a where. A who, a what, and a where. And what I've got to figure out is the who, the what, and the where that's inside this envelope. See, at the beginning of the game, a who is put in this envelope, a what is put in this envelope, and a where is put in this envelope. And I got to figure out what's in the envelope before my opponents figure out what's in it. And that's how you win the game of Clue. Now you're probably saying, what does this have to do with anything spiritual, Pastor? Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search out the matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of kings to search out the matter. See, when you were born, you were born with a purpose. Your purpose is a who. Your purpose is a what. Your purpose is a where. And your job, your assignment, is to search out why God put you on this planet. See, it is the glory of God to conceal these things, but it's the glory of kings to search these things out. So when we begin the game of Clue, we start playing because we've got to solve a problem. I've got to solve the problem of who did it and what they did it with and where it took place. I've got to solve this problem. And here's what I've learned. Almost all success in life is solving problems. If you want to be successful, Start solving people's problems. If you're really good at solving problems, eventually somebody will pay you for it. So for instance, if you clean homes in here, there are people that have a problem. They're too busy. They don't have time to clean their houses. And so they will pay somebody to solve that problem for them. 
anything in life that's, that you can get paid for, all you have to do to be successful, you want to be rich, you want to be wealthy, figure out how to solve problems. Every invention was a solution to a problem. When you walk around your house today, just, just look at all the inventions that are in your home and understand that every one of those inventions solves a problem. We got to solve this problem. What's our problem? We got to figure out why God put us on this planet. We got to figure out why was I ever born? What is the meaning of life? There is a hidden purpose that God wants you to search out. And here's why it's important. Have you ever been to a party where they had name tags at the door? And so when you came in, you had to get a marker and you had to sign your name and the name tag said, hello, my name is. And so people begin to sign their names on these name tags. And then somebody walks up. There's always that one person that comes to the party. You're not sure how they got invited, but they found out there was a party. So they invited themselves and they come to the party and everybody kind of goes, oh, because when they write down their name, hello, my name is whatever. Everybody goes, that's not your name because your name is miserable. And what you should have written down was, hello, my name is miserable and get ready because whatever fun you were about to have, it's over now because I'm here. I'm miserable. Now you may be saying, I've never met a person like that. So the question you have to ask is, am I that person? Here's what the Bible says about being miserable. A miserable heart means a miserable life. A cheerful heart fills the day with song. So a miserable person, a miserable heart means you're going to have a miserable life. But when you have a cheerful heart, your day is filled with song. So I wonder if anybody's miserable. I started reading some studies that were done here recently. And here's what I found out. Americans are miserable. In fact, how much do Americans hate their jobs? A Gallup poll, a Gallup poll found out that 77% of Americans hate their job, which means you get up every Monday morning and you hate the sound of the alarm clock, you hate getting ready, and you hate the building you've got to go to, and you hate the people you have to work with, and you hate the drive that you have to take to get there and the drive to get back home. What a way to live life. Isn't that the American dream? I want to wake up every day miserable. That's why people are looking forward to the weekends. That's why the second they get to that, as soon as that, whatever the five o'clock, six o'clock, whenever the end of the day rolls around, people are pole vaulting to the door because they are miserable at work. 77% of you. Over 50% of marriages end in divorce. One of the main reasons people cite unhappy or miserable in their marriage. Okay. Well, somebody took the study a little bit further and here's what they found out. Unhappily married adults who divorced or separated were no happier on average than unhappily married adults who stayed in the marriage. So if you think you're going to get divorced to be happy, you're going to be no happier than the person who is miserable in their marriage. So here's what you got to decide. Do you want to be miserable and lonely or do you want to be miserable and at least have somebody to talk to? Here's what I've learned about misery. It loves company. They did a study on what is the happiest state in America. Can you guess what it is? Hawaii. Hawaii. So I've got this idea. I know it's crazy. I know we just built this parking lot, everything else. What say we just give this place away and we all go start a church in Hawaii? Who's with me? All of us together. That's how cults get started. Hawaii. Life expectancy in Hawaii. 81 and a half years on average, the highest of anywhere in America. Obesity rate, 25.7%, 20th lowest. Median household income, are you ready for this? The median, 61,821, eighth highest in America. Now, there's a bottom of the list. So if Hawaii's the happiest, 
There's got to be somebody down at the bottom. Well, I went to the bottom of the list. Here's what I found out. Coming in at number 42, Indiana. Life expectancy. Any, I got any Indiana folks in the room. All right, number 42. Life expectancy, 77 and 7 years. 16th lowest. Obesity, 28%. 13th highest. Median household income, 46,000. Coming in at number 44 out of 50. OH. I O, we're miserable. Life expectancy, 77 and a half years, 13th lowest. Obesity, 29 and a half percent, eighth highest. Meet Cincinnati is the chili capital of the world. I found this out. True statistic, there are more chili restaurants per capita in Cincinnati than any place in the world. Congratulations, Cincinnati. We did it. We did it. Median household income, $45,749, 16th lowest. Number 49, Kentucky. <laughs> Kentucky. Life expectancy, 76.2 years. I think it's all the smoking. Seventh lowest, obesity. I'm, I'm, that's wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Obesity, 29.7%, sixth highest. Median household income, 41000 the fourth lowest of anywhere in America. Congratulations, everybody. You live in the epicenter of misery. We are in the tri-state of miserable people. That's what we're surrounded by right now. Miserable, 42, 44, 49, the most miserable states in America, and we're right smack dab in the middle of them. Congratulations. What does miserable mean? Listen to the word miserable. Wretchedly unhappy or uncomfortable. Wretchedly unhappy or uncomfortable. Are you miserable? Why are you miserable? So I learned some things about miserable people. Number one, miserable people always operate from a place of lack. They never have enough. Miserable people are always talking about, I wish I had, I wish I had. If I had more of this, I'd be happy. If I had more of that, I'd be happy. They never have enough, so they're miserable. Miserable people, they're afraid. They're always trying to survive life. They never talk about thriving in life. Nothing is ever about thriving to them. It's always about surviving. I got to survive this day. I got to survive this week. If I could just make it to the end of the week, if I could just make it to the everything survival. Man, survival's a miserable way to live. God doesn't want you to survive. God wants you to thrive in life. In other words, what's drowning everybody else ought to be what you're riding on top of. But how many people do you know that are always just trying to keep their head above the water? Just trying to keep our head above the water. They're just trying to survive. Finally, miserable people are filled with miserable thoughts. You can talk to them about anything and they can make it negative. You can talk to them about ice cream and the first thing out of their mouth is, do you know what that's doing to your arteries? Do you know how you're going to die? You're going to die ice cream. So, miserable people, miserable thoughts, and many of you are miserable in here today. You're wretchedly unhappy and uncomfortable. But can I tell you one of the biggest reasons that people are miserable? They don't know their why. They don't know their purpose. And it is a miserable, miserable thing to go through life and not know why God created you. Imagine going through life and dying and never knowing why God put you on planet earth to begin with. Could it be that you are the one person that when God was creating people, he just ran out of things for you to do and you just came into existence for no reason whatsoever. What a miserable, miserable way to live. And you know what? God's been trying to tell you. He's been telling, trying to, he's been doing his best to tell you why you were created. You say, God's been talking to me. Yeah, he's been talking. You just haven't been listening. How's God been talking? Well, he's been saying things like, what breaks your heart? See, there's a reason that that breaks your heart, but not somebody else's because that's your purpose. What makes you angry when you see something and it makes you angry? That could be your purpose. What do you care about that other people 
don't seem to care about. That could be your purpose. And it's so funny because God can use anything to be your purpose. And when you start living out your purpose, you come alive. We have a, a gentleman, he came out here, he set all this stuff up. His name is Tim Smith. And uh, Tim owns his own business, Tim's Pools and Spas, up on 42. He's been very successful. Now, you got to know Tim. If you came to Tim today and gave him the worst news in the world, his face would look like this. If you gave Tim the best news in the world, his face would look like this. Tim never changes his emotions until you talk to him about a hot tub. And the moment you mention hot tub to Tim, it's like, I mean, it's like the elf, Buddy the Elf. He gets so excited, he just wants to tell everybody he's running up and down the street, hot tubs! You say, why? That's his purpose. You say, spas? Hot tubs? See, God has blessed him and blessed his business, and he pours back into the kingdom faithfully. And God is using him to enlarge the kingdom of God here at City Gate Church. So yes, that's his purpose. And whenever you talk to him about it, he just comes alive. What has God been trying to talk to you about? What has God been trying to get your attention with, but you're just not listening? Maybe parents can understand this. If you have a child and you try to tell them something, but they don't listen and they go do it anyways and then realize you were right, they will never say you were right, but you just, the look on their face is priceless when you know you were right. So we had this moment with Sage the other day and, uh, we live where we can see Kings Island. And so the, the, the Halloween thing was going on. The haunt thing was going on. And Kate Sage kept saying, my friends go. I want to go. I want to go. And I thought, well, I'm not going to let her go with somebody else. I said, okay, you want to go? You don't want to go. I'm telling you. You're going to walk in. You're going to walk through the front door. Somebody's going to scream and you're going to want to go home. No, I won't. I'm going to go. I'm going to walk through everything. I'm going to see everything. Okay, Sage, I'll tell you what. I'll go with you because I wanted to be there to see her face. So I took her, drive in, we get, we get through the front gate and up comes this guy and goes, Rah! she breaks down in tears and says, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. And I just looked at her and said, I tried to tell you. My question is, are you miserable today? And God's sitting up in heaven going, I tried to to tell you, you're never going to be happy. You can keep chasing all these things, but you are never going to be happy until you find out why I created you and what I created you to do. Here's the big idea. Your purpose can make you miserable when you're not living it. Purpose unrecognized, purpose unfulfilled, purpose ignored will make you miserable because God does not want you to settle in life, especially for somebody else's purpose. Here's the big idea. Your future is bigger than you realize. Your future is so big. And I want you to say this with me. Are you ready? God created me on purpose for a purpose. Say that again. God created me on purpose for a purpose. Say it again. God created me on purpose for a purpose. Now look at somebody and say, God created you on purpose for a purpose. Here's what that means. There is no such thing as an oops baby. There's no such thing as an accident. Well, we didn't plan that one. God planned it. God had a purpose and a plan, gave it a name while it was in its mother's womb, and said, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations, and it's not even been born yet, but God had a purpose for it. There is no, you are not an accident. Don't let anybody tell you you're an accident. You were created on purpose for a purpose. God doesn't make mistakes. So how do we play Clue? If you've never played Clue before, it may take you a second to figure out how to play this game. So you got your board and there's this, these little boxes all over the board. And then around the board, there's these rooms and I got to go in these rooms. And then there's, there's, um, the weapons, the crime was committed with, and then you get character cards and all this stuff. And I got to figure out the who, the what, and the where that's inside that envelope. So I thought, well, how do you play clue? And I looked up how to win at clue. 
So this Thanksgiving, I'm going to prepare you how to blow all your family out of the water. You're going to win at Clue, follow these simple instructions, and you're going to be the champion of Clue. Here we go. Number one, if you want to win at Clue, figure out your opponent's cards. So everybody else has cards. There's one card or three cards that nobody has because they're inside that envelope. If I want to win, I have to figure out what cards my opponents are holding. Guess what? You've got an opponent. Jesus said you've got an enemy called the devil who came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So you got to figure out, you know what? The devil's holding some cards today and you need to figure out what cards the devil is holding. Let me tell you some of his cards. His cards are the enemies of your purpose. Here's card number one, the card of comparison. If you want to win, if you want to find your purpose, you better figure out what the enemy is trying to get you to compare your purpose against. You cannot compare your assignment to anybody else's assignment. Because when you get to heaven, God is not going to judge you whether or not you were as good as that person. God is going to judge you based on whether you did what he told you to do. So it doesn't matter if God asked them to write a book and they sell 10 million copies. God asked you to write a book and you sell one. When you go to heaven, all God's going to say is, did you write the book? I don't care how many you sold. I want to know, did you write the book? But we live in an Instagram, a Facebook, a Twitter, a TikTok, a LinkedIn, uh, uh, all these other social media. And you, they only exist to get you to constantly compare your life, your purpose, and your happiness against everybody else. Guess what? Everybody else that's per posting on Instagram is miserable just like you are. Stop comparing your purpose against theirs and go out and do what God called you to do. And don't worry, is anybody, I don't know if I'm happy. Stop worrying about it. Just do what God called you to do. The card of comparison. Card number two, you got to learn that the enemy is carrying the card of confusion. If he can't get you to compare your purpose, he'll get you confused about your purpose. So he'll get you to go through life and I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what I'm anointed to do. I don't know what I'm gifted to do. But guess what? If it's confusion, God's not in it. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. But that where there is confusion, there is every evil work because the devil is the author of confusion. So if you are doing something right now and all it's doing is bringing confusion into your home, God is not the author of it. I don't care how much money you're making, God is not the author of confusion. That's the enemy's card. Card number three, this is a tough one, counterfeit. If I can't get you with comparison, if I can't get you with confusion, then I will pull out a card that is really similar and close to your purpose, but is not your purpose. And I'll slide that counterfeit card and use it against your life. This is what the enemy did with Adam and Eve. He shows up to Eve and he says, do you want to be like God? Eat the fruit. And God's sitting there going, you're already like me. Why are you going to eat the apple when you're already made in my image and likeness? The apple is just a counterfeit of what I've already given you. Don't fall for the counterfeit. This is the enemy's card. So the instructions go on to say that you need to eliminate one possibility every turn. Every time you get a turn in clue, clue eliminate a character, eliminate a possibility of a character or a, a thing or a place. Eliminate these because here's what it says. Eliminating all false possibilities is your ultimate goal. The player who does this the fastest has a huge advantage over the other players. In other words, you need to find your purpose as soon as you can because purpose diminishes distractions. People get distracted because they don't know their purpose. That's why if you're, if you're a teenager in here, find your purpose as a teenager and you'll save yourself a lot of trouble in life because you won't run after all this stuff no matter how good the devil makes it look. You won't chase after it because you know your purpose purpose. Purpose diminishes distractions. When I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a politician. I really did. I wanted to be a politician. 
I wanted to be a governor. I wanted to be a senator. I wanted to be a president one day. I had all laid out. Then I realized that wasn't going to work. So I thought, well, I'll be a realtor. And then I thought, well, I don't, I'm not good with numbers. So I'll be a lawyer. But then I'm like, well, I tell the truth. I'm 10. That's wrong. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. I'll be a lawyer. And the lawyer thing didn't work out. See, I had all these possibilities. And, and look at this. Politician, realtor, lawyer. It's amazing how they're all slightly similar to what I'm up here doing today. They were distractions. But because I knew my purpose, I didn't get distracted by all these other opportunities. Listen, when you know your purpose, you won't marry just anybody. That's a good word right there. I don't know who you're dating right now, but if they don't line up with your purpose, if they... If they're not going to help you get to your purpose, if their purpose isn't like, that's what the Bible means by unequally yoked. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with, is your purpose aligned? And you won't marry anybody. You, 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 can, you can thin out your choices real quick when you know what you're called to do. When you know your purpose, you won't just move anywhere. Yeah, but we got this job offer. I'm going to make $10,000 more in this city. Oh, so you found a church there? No, we haven't found a church yet. So let me get this straight. You're about to uproot your family and take them to a city. You don't even know if there's a church there for you to worship. You don't even know if there's a church there, God. So you're going to sell out your future for $10,000 a year? No, thank you. I'll stay here because I have a purpose here. God's called me to something here. It's getting quiet in this church now. See, when you know your purpose, you won't just go anywhere and do anything. Your purpose will keep you out of problems. Your purpose will keep you out of trouble when you know your purpose. No, I'm not going to go there and do that. I know my purpose. I'm not going to go hang out with them. I know my purpose. When you know your purpose, you'll choose purpose over popularity. I need people to like me. Not when you know your purpose. See, when you know your purpose, you don't care who likes you or who doesn't like you. I know what I'm called to do. I know what I'm gifted to do. I know my purpose in life because living for the approval of people keeps you from the purposes of God. Living for the approval of people keeps you from the purposes of God. Not everybody's going to like you. Imagine a world. That sounds like a movie commercial. Imagine a world. Everyone likes you. Everyone approves of you. Everyone admires you. Imagine a world. Everybody loves you. Everybody approves of you. Everybody admires you. You walk in the room. Everybody stands up and claps for you. And now come back to reality because that's never going to happen. Not possible will never happen. But let me tell you what is possible. Imagine a world where you don't care about what other people think, where you are so focused on pleasing God that people's, people's approval doesn't consume you. You don't live for people. You don't live for the applause of people. You live for the applause of heaven. Because guess what? When I die, ain't none of you going to be clapping for me. But I'm living for the applause of one, the one who sits on the throne. I want him to look down, and I want him to clap and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few. You didn't get distracted. You stayed focused on a few things. Now I'm going to make your ruler over many. Come see the joy I have prepared for you. Somebody tell somebody I'm living for the applause of one. I've faced distractions from people since the very beginning. Everybody will try to distract you. The enemy will strategically place people in your life just to distract you from your purpose. But when you know your purpose, it'll keep you from getting into wrong relationships. It'll, it, it will help you decide who you're supposed to be friends with and who you're supposed to be friendly with. There's a big difference. See, because when I'm a friend with somebody, I give them the ability to speak into my life. When I'm friendly with somebody, I love you. We're going to go to heaven one day, but I'm not giving you a place in my life. You're not going to influence me, my decisions, or my life because I got a purpose. Critics, when you know your purpose, can't stop you. Obstacles, when you know your purpose, won't deter you. 
Pain, when you know your purpose, won't even slow you down. You get up earlier, you work harder, you stay later, purpose drives you. Drives you, my goodness. I'm, I'm not a hip hop fan, all right? I admit it, I'm not big on rap. I don't listen to a lot of rap. Vanilla Ice, MC Hammer, that's my rap playlist right there. I'm not big on rap, but I had to run that 5K yesterday, and it was something like negative 50 degrees out there, being people frozen on the sidewalk. It was cold, and I'm out there, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm new to this whole running thing, and I, I put on the Kanye album, and I'm telling you right now, you my Chick-fil-A, closed on Sunday. It kept pushing me. What I'm trying to tell you is when you know your purpose, it'll push you like that Kanye album. It'll keep you running even when you don't feel like running, even when you don't feel like keep going forward. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I already told Blake I want to hear at least 12 of them songs right here on this platform. Here was, here was another point from that list. Don't waste your rooms. Look at somebody and say, don't waste your rooms. Don't waste your rooms. So on this board, there are these, these rooms. And I can only begin to solve the problems and ask questions when I'm in a room. Remember this. Your purpose is in a place. Your purpose is in a place. And when you get to that place, it'll reveal your purpose. There is a place that will reveal your purpose. And there's a purpose for every room that you go in. We're in a room here today. When you leave, you're going to go home. Your home is full of rooms. Family room. Kitchen. Bedroom bathroom, basement, all of them have a different purpose in your home. And you understand that there are some things you do in this room that you don't do in this room. So for instance, if somebody invites you over their house and says, I'm going to go back here in the bathroom and cook you up some bacon and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> You'd be like, you go ahead. As soon as you leave, I'm out of this house. Because that's not the purpose of that room. We understand that in our homes, that the kitchen has a purpose, and the bedroom, and the family room, and the, the these rooms have purposes. I'm not talking about a natural room to you today. I'm talking about you're going to find yourself in life in rooms, in seasons. But there's no such thing as a wasted room when you understand why God put you in that room. And you may not enjoy the room. In fact, there is one room in our house that I'm convinced is a pointless room. It's called the hallway. You don't cook in the hallway. You don't sleep in the hallway. The hallway seems like a pointless room. And when you have lived a season of your life in a room and you begin to realize its purpose and then all of a sudden God opens the doors and thrusts you out in the hallway, you are between rooms and it's a painful season because you don't understand I got no purpose here God I can't do anything in this room God and you start complaining to God why am I in a hallway God how long am I going to be in the hallway God why did you ever let me end up in a hallway God and what God wants you to realize is the fact that you're in a hallway means you completed your assignment in this room and now I'm transitioning you to a whole nother room get ready you're about to step into a new season don't cry in the hallway, shout in the hallway. Don't doubt in the hallway, dance in the hallway. Don't pout in the hallway, praise in the hallway. I'm moving on to something better. Somebody give Jesus a big praise. Hallways are painful. Sure they are. We don't like hallways. But the way our house is, we got a kitchen on one end, our bedroom's on the other end. And the only way you go from one room to the other, you got to go through the hallway. Imagine me getting so frustrated because I don't want to go in the hallway. So I just decided to start sleeping in the kitchen. <laughs> getting ready in the kitchen in the morning. You'd think there was something wrong with me. 
Why? Because I'm avoiding the hallway. I need to embrace the hallway because it's taking me into a whole new room. But when you know your purpose, even when you get in the hallway, it'll push you through the pain. Purpose will push you through the difficult times. One step at a time. I remember, so me and Kim, we'd been on about three dates and I was, I was living in Mason. And so I invited Kim over and she had brought her sister's dog and I had a little dog and, and I thought this is going to be my night. I'm going to get my first kiss tonight. I, I, I've been on three dates with this girl. I've spent a lot of money on dinner and I haven't got a kiss yet. Tonight's my night. First kiss. So it got dark outside. It was a summer night and I decided to, uh, spring night, and I decided to ask her to take a walk. Let's go walk the dogs. Had it all planned out. There was this path behind where I lived and, and it was a beautiful, beautiful walk, beautiful walking track. And, and you could see the, the swimming pool over here was all lit up, just creating ambiance and in the distance was Kings Island and it was all lit up. And I thought, this is going to be it. I'm going to get my first kiss right here tonight. Now, what I'm about to tell you is the truth. I am not making this up. So I'm ready. I'm ready to get this kiss, right? At that moment, the dogs, because we had turned and we had started talking to each other face to face, the dogs start chasing each other around us. And as they do, the leash starts pulling us closer together. I'm like, won't he do it? Won't he do it? He controls the wind and the waves. He controls dogs. My God, it's a wonder. Look at this. I mean, it was just getting closer. Again. I can't do anything about these dogs, baby. Come on. And then at the same time, I'm not making this up. The fireworks at Kings Island start going off. I'm like, this is it. This is the story we're going to tell our grandkids. And we're going to say, this is how your mom and how grandma and grandpa had their first kiss. It's going to be just a, such a magical moment. God, you orchestrated this whole thing. Thank you. So here we are. We're being pulled together. And I'm getting closer. And now I'm ready. Right? Go in for the kill. Target set. Target locked, I'm going in for the kill. And I get right up to her, and she goes just like this. So I did what any good Christian guy would do. I just hugged her and started praying, God, I just thank you for Kim, and I thank you for this. It's a true story. didn't get the kiss <laughs> in case you're wondering nope she didn't turn back around but I didn't stop either it took me a couple more dates I got that kiss I, I, I got married to her now I can kiss her whenever I want wake up in the morning kiss her go to bed at night kiss her come home walk in the house for any reason in the world I can kiss her whenever I want because she's my wife because I didn't stop when I got rejected and listen, when you know your purpose, even when a door shuts in your face or even when an opportunity turns away from you, you say, I'm not going to stop because I know my purpose. I know my purpose and I'm not going to stop until I see God's purpose fulfilled. Devil, you can shut all the doors you want, but you can't shut a door that God won't open when it comes time for my purpose. Somebody give God a big praise. Come on, give him a praise. He's preaching on Clue today. How's he doing that? Spend, times in the room, spend time in the rooms you have. In other words, excel in the room you're in. Whatever room you're in that right now, be the best at that room. Whatever season you're in right now, learn all you can in that season and be the best you can be in that season. Because that will determine how soon you get to leave that room and go on to the next one. Use the room you're in. Here's another point. Don't give away new information. So all the opponents have cards. 
I have cards. I'm trying to figure out which cards they have. They're trying to figure out what cards I have. Here's my word to you. Stop showing the devil all your cards. Let me tell you something about Satan. He is not all-knowing. God is all-knowing, but not the devil. Satan only knows what you tell him. Stop telling him everything you're afraid of. Stop telling him everything that upsets you. Stop telling him what gives you anxiety. Stop telling him what stresses you out. Stop telling him what keeps you awake at night. Stop telling him what is making your life awful. Because every time you tell him, he says, I'm going to play that card. Well, you say, then how do I get deliverance from this? You go into a closet of prayer. That's called the secret place of the Most High. And you can get alone with God, and the devil doesn't know what you're praying about. Stop telling the devil all your business. Here's another point. Make deductions based on opponent information. So see, I'm trying to figure out what's in that envelope. And the way I do it is I got to figure out my opponent's information. And you got to listen to what your opponents are saying. You got to listen to the questions they're asking. You got to listen to what they're saying. And then you begin to figure it out. See, I've learned that my assignment is often masked by the devil's lies. And whatever he's lying to me about is probably covering up a purpose that God put on the inside of me. So whenever the devil is hitting you with something, pay attention to what he's hitting you with. Your purpose may just be hidden in it. For instance, I can remember the day the thought of flying paralyzed me. I would have to go to the doctor. I remember calling a doctor in a panic one time because I ran out of medicine and I was going to have to take a flight. And I said, you've got, I called him. He was off work. I called him in the, at night to get medicine because I knew I had to take this flight. I was that afraid. The week le- leading up to a flight, I was, I was horrible. I was so angry because I was so full of anxiety just thinking that I had to get. Now, why did the devil make me afraid of flying? Because he knew God put a purpose on me to fly from one end of the nation to the other and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and see people saved and delivered and set free. Could it be that what the devil is making you afraid of today is just hiding the purpose that God called you to live out? My calling is contained within the chatter. You know, when the devil's talking to, to his his, his, his little, little demons, when they're talking, all I got to do is listen, listen to where they're talking that they're going to hit me. And when I listen to their chatter, I know what their target is. And their target's revealing what I'm called to do. Let me explain it like this. If you're feeling insecure about being a good mother, it could be because you're raising a world changer. And the reason the devil keeps whispering in your ear that you're not a good mother is because he knows if you ever believe that your purpose is not something you're going to do, but something you're going to raise. You may be feeling insecure about being a good husband, but it could be that that God is going to use you to bless and build other marriages. The devil could be chattering about taking that step of faith because he knows if you ever take that step of faith, God's going to bless you, bless your business, bless your endeavor, and you are going to in return be a blessing to the kingdom and lives are going to be changed through your step of faith. Listen to the chatter. They can come to the music. I'm almost done. So at the beginning of the game, a who what and a where is put inside this envelope. A who, what, and a where. And you spend the whole game figuring out who is in this envelope, what is in this envelope, and the where, the place that's in this envelope. My job in life, because I'm a king, Remember, you're a king and a priest. My job is to search out, number one, who I am in Jesus Christ. Number two, what has God uniquely gifted me to do? And number three, where 
has he called me to do it? And when you figure that out, see, here's what happens. At the beginning of the game, a who, a what, and a where is put in this envelope. The word envelope means to wrap up, to trap. If you think of envelop, to swallow up. And I guarantee you there are people in this room today that at some point in your life, the enemy did something and you felt like you became enveloped in what the enemy did to you. Somebody may have abused you and you just like the problem swallowed you up. Somebody betrayed you and you feel like the problem just swallowed you up. Somebody walked out on you and you can't even think about purpose because all life just got swallowed up in that moment. You know what the enemy wants you to do? Stay away from this envelope. Get away from, don't mess with that envelope because inside that envelope, you're going to be reminded about when they hurt you. You're going to be reminded about when they lied to you. You're going to be reminded about when they betrayed you. You'll you'll be reminded about when they abused you. Stay away from that envelope because the only thing in that envelope is a big problem. Why is he telling you that? Because the devil's a liar. So if he's telling you the problems in the envelope, the opposite must be true. It's not a problem in the envelope. It's an answer in the envelope. And if you ever open up and begin to realize that what happened was the enemy was trying to hold you back because he knew if that who and that what and that where ever gets out, they're going to wreak havoc on my kingdom. So I've got to swallow them up. But guess what? God is in here today. The Holy Ghost is in here today because he's ready to reveal your purpose to you. You are not here by accident. God has gifted you. God has called you. And there is a place that God has put an assignment on your life and he has called you to do what no one else can do but you. Stand your feet all over this room. If you receive this word today, I want you to give Jesus a big praise in this room and tell Jesus, I receive my purpose.